my name is Don Goodrich and I'll be doing the rudder talk this month and <clears throat> so we're going to start with Luke 12 and it starts out meanwhile while the crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another Jesus began to speak first to his disciples saying be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that is not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of, in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw it into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God? Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth much more, many, much more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before man, the Son of Man, will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before the men will be disowned before the angels of God. So today, I want to share with you about taking a stand for the Word of God and why some people don't. They are fearful of taking a stand because they fear people more than they fear God. The Bible says repeatedly, fear the Lord. Do you fear God or people? In saying this, I want to talk about hypocrisy. And there's two types for Christians. One, Christians hiding their sin from other believers. They put on a mask and to cover up who they are. They're afraid of being ridiculed or ignored for their sin. They're fearful of people. And two, Christians hiding their faith and love for Jesus from non-believers. Do you want to be do you want to be true self to your true self in Christ or gain the approval of people? People already know who you are by how you live your life and treat your relationships. There's no secrets. As it was with the Pharisees in Luke 11. The Pharisees were living in their lies and guilting the people to do as they wanted, making them feel degraded, not measuring up. So why do we lie? Wouldn't it be great to be free of the guilt of lies in our lives? Do you want to stand for what you believe, to be your true self in Christ, or to gain approval of people? In Luke 11, Jesus was conf confronting the Pharisees about their pridefulness, about their thinking that they were better than others, and about putting on a mask to cover up who they were, being prideful in hypocrisy. And while this was going on, then it starts in Chapter 12, it says, Meanwhile, while the crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. It says that a crowd of many thousands had gathered and they were getting trampled. It wasn't just a bunch of people calmly sitting down, going to listen to a speaker. It said people were getting trampled. They were there out of desperation. They wanted to see the man who had done these remarkable miracles. They wanted a miracle in their life. Have you ever been in such a big crowd that um, was moving shoulder to shoulder and being fearful of falling and getting trampled? Maybe at a sporting event or a concert, a Black Friday sale, or a, just a violent act in a crowd. It's very scary. Back to Jesus. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and said, Hey guys, be on your guard. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Now we all know that a little yeast will work through a whole batch of dough. And lies work the same way. Just because everyone at work is doing it, don't do it. Jesus says, be careful guys. Don't be like one of the Pharisees in saying one thing and doing another. 
Be on your guard against lying because it will become a habit. Thinking people will like you more, it's a lie. Like a disease, it will consume you. You tell a lie, then you have to tell another lie just to keep someone from discovering the first lie. It's never ending. And at the end, and it's never ending. And the Pharisees modeled this hypocrisy well. In verse 2, Jesus tells his friends this warning. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. After telling a lie, you have to tell more lies to keep it concealed. Concealed means to cover or to close in on all sides. So when telling a lie after lie, you are trying to conceal the truth because of what you fear, what people think about you. Jesus says nothing is concealed. When you go to the grave, there will be no secrets concealed from God. The Bible says that one day everything will be brought into the light that has been hidden in the darkness. In 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Jesus says, The Lord will bring it to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Think about that. The Lord will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of your heart. Jesus says it here, and he says the same thing four times. I don't know any place else that Jesus said a point four times, but he said it four times here, verses 2 through 4. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known, what you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of, in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Jesus is telling his disciples, see how useless it is to lie? Because everything is going to come out. I'm going to tell it all. I have a question for you. The question is, do you really believe in your heart that it will never benefit you to lie? Think about that. Do you really believe that it will never benefit you to lie? Haven't we all said to ourselves that we've um, been in a situation where we thought it would be better to lie? Maybe thinking it would help someone else or myself. That's a good thing, right? Or do you believe that it would be best never to lie? What it comes down to is whether you believe that there's a God in heaven Who's in control? Do you believe God is in control? Is God sovereign? If we believe this, then don't we think God would bless our decision to lie? I don't think so. Or if I tell the truth, will God punish me for it? God is in control. If God is in control, and He is, is it not going to be the it's not going to be the best thing for me to lie? So why lie? Because if I tell the truth, it's going to hurt. And it probably will at first. But we must believe that by telling the truth in a difficult situation, God will honor that somehow. And in the long run, we will see it as a lesson for our character. A hurt that is really a blessing. I've experienced this myself, and it's so true. So why do we lie? What it comes down to is, what do we fear? Why do we lie to people? Fear of ridicule or what they're going to do to us? We fear the sarcasm from people of being a Jesus freak or a Bible thumper. or We lie to believers because we're afraid of being rejected by them because of our sin. Bottom line, it's fear. In verses 4 and 5 it says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the killing of the body has the power to throw into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. What do you fear right now? What you fear most determines, what, determines how you're going to live your life. If you fear God, you will live differently. This isn't Jesus talking to the Pharisees, but Jesus talking to his friends, his disciples. 
Verse 4, he says, My friends, don't worry about people, but fear God who can throw you into hell. It's very, very plain. Don't be afraid to stand up for what Jesus says, but say it yourselves. God commands us not to be afraid of people. Who are we scared of right now? Whose admiration are we after? Jesus says, fear God and God alone. Fear Him. In Psalm 111, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do we understand and believe this? The foundation of wisdom is to fear God. Fear Him. If we have wisdom, we know that one day we will have to face our Creator. Today you may think that you have problems, but the biggest problem we have is knowing that one day we're going to stand before a holy God. Imagine that. One day stand before God, all the angels, lightning and thunder, and at that moment, your late bill is not the issue anymore. You're standing before an almighty God is the issue, and the Bible says to fear that moment. Fear Him who can throw you into hell. And that's when we start to get it, when we fear Him. Wisdom starts with fearing the one who can throw you into hell. Now we realize, I better make peace with Him. So often we don't start the relationship with fear. That's why many people sit, sit back and say, I don't know if I want to start following Jesus yet. Or I don't know if I want to get rid of that sin yet. We think this because we don't fear God. There's no urgency. We think there's a little guy in the sky and maybe we'll follow him or maybe not. I don't really want to yet. But if we understand who God really is, we would be urgent. We would want to get things right with the Lord because we fear Him. It starts with fear. <clears throat> Lack of fearing God is causing chaos in the Church of America today. Why do you think so many churches have lessened their stance on divorce, greed, sexual immorality? Do you think they fear God and that He wants them to change His laws? No, it's because everybody else wants to change His laws. When we fear God, we are not going to alter His Word. This is what He said, and we need to take a stand on it. God has the power to throw you into hell. Jesus was very compassionate and firm in telling His friends this truth, and we should also. This is what true love looks like, speaking the truth in love. The fear of God works something like this. As a parent, you would love it if your kids cleaned their room because they love you. Mom, Dad, I love you so much. Look what I did. We love it when this happens, but this probably doesn't happen all the time or maybe just a few times ever. As a parent, we love it when our children do something special for us because they love us, but most of the time we go to plan B, which is do it or else. And the kids usually do it because you're the parent. Christianity isn't much different. As believers, we know God loves us, so we are to be honest and not lie. We know God does what He does for our good, and we're going to do His commands because we love Him. As our faith grows, this happens more and more. But when we don't, we need to fall back on plan B. God says, obey me or else. Obey me because I'm a holy God. It would be great if we followed Jesus' example and we're perfectly all the time. But truth is, sometimes we need to obey just because He's God. Big holy God, little me. I better obey. That's what it comes down to. Fear of the holy God. Hebrews 10.31 says it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Then Jesus tells his friends of their value in verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth much more than any sparrows. Five sparrows for two coins. Didn't have pennies back then. There used to be a bounty on sparrows, and you could shoot them for a few cents. 
they didn't seem to be worth much. But it says every one of them are remembered by God. He takes notice of every sparrow ever since he created them. Then Jesus says, he knows the number of the hairs on your head. He is all-knowing and caring God. Jesus tells his friends, don't be afraid because God values you much more than sparrows. He takes notice of all of you. Remember that his close friends were not people of no character or thought of highly because of their wealth or honor in society when Jesus picked them. They were common men, fishermen, a tax collector, not anyone who was thought of as special. They were not noticed by many. When we see the awesomeness of God, that is when we appreciate his protection and provision for us. Maybe we didn't recognize or understand his glory or majesty and what he was going to do to the world in the end. But when we realize that he has what he has done and can do and how much he values us, we don't have to fear. Many of us uh, remember this next passage in this verses 8 and 9. It says, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. Jesus says, whoever disowns me before men, I'm going to disown him before the Father. You won't speak up for me, I won't speak up for you. The word acknowledge meant that it was a public confession for Jesus. The word acknowledge in the Greek means to speak the same. Jesus was saying, will you say the things that I say? Jesus said, there's a God in heaven who can send your soul to hell. So I say, there's a God in heaven who can send your soul to hell. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So I say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus said that he died for our sins, and I say, Jesus died for our sins. Let us not be afraid to repeat what Jesus said to us in his word. In talking of these two verses, it reminds me of a story about a man named Stan Gerlach. He was a real man, and the story is true. Stan and his wife were at a memorial service, and during the service, people were standing up and talking about memories with the man that died. Stan gets up and decides to confess Jesus Christ. He felt led to tell them about Jesus and how to get to heaven. Stan said that this man is in heaven now, and I helped lead him to the Lord. He gives the story and the gospel. Then he tells the people there, listen, you don't know when God's going to take your life, and at that moment, there's nothing you can do about it. Are you ready? Stan said this twice more before he sat down. You don't know when God's going to take your life, and at that second, there's nothing you can do about it. Are you ready? Then Stan sat down next to his wife and said to her, I got this strange feeling in my chest, and he leaned over and died right there in the middle of the memorial service, and his son John tried to revive him. Then the paramedics came in and they did all they knew to try to revive him to bring him back to life. It was just like Stan said, when it's time and God takes your life, there's nothing you can do about it. You better be ready. So Stan's pastor gets the call that Stan had died. So he got ready and went to the family's home. He gets there and Stan's wife Susie was just returning and while crying her eyes out, she come running up to the preacher and saying, Stan's dead. We've all been, we've been married so long, what am I gonna do? Then John, Stan's son, come up with tears in his eyes and says, my dad's gone. He's died, he, my dad's gone. Then John said, I'm so proud of my dad. He died doing what he loved doing, telling people about Jesus. Then John repeated the story of what his dad said to the people at the memorial service. Well, family and friends were going into the house, so the preacher followed. When he entered the family's home, they asked him to say something to all of them. When the preacher opened his Bible, the Holy Spirit took him to the same passage, but in a different, in Matthew's account, 
in 10 and 32, where Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Stan looked at the people and said, Just imagine and think how Stan felt today. One second he's on earth looking at a bunch of people telling them this is who Jesus is. Then the next second he's in heaven and he hears the voice of Jesus say, Father, this is who Stan Gerlach is. Can you imagine? What would that feel like? What would it feel like to have Jesus talk about you? To hear Jesus confess you to God? If you died today, what would it feel like to be in heaven and Jesus talking to the Father about you? The Father and all of his holy angels are there and Jesus says, This is Don. This is Chuck. This is Rick. This is you. And Jesus speaks on your behalf. He doesn't hesitate. He speaks up for you. Jesus will speak the truth about you. What will that feel like, having the Lord and Savior Jesus speak about you to the Father before his angels? To have Jesus say your name and that you were not afraid of people. Just imagine it. You, God, Jesus, angelic beings, and Jesus saying this about you. And he wasn't afraid to talk to people about you, Father. He wasn't scared. But said what needed to be said. He spoke up for you. What's that moment going to feel like? To have Jesus speak up for you and the Father say, Well done. This is what our purpose in life should be. Do you want everybody to go to your funeral and talk about all your wealth and your toys you had or the things you'd done? Or do you want the Father to say, well done. Jesus Christ is going to give you a reception and talk about how you were on earth. Jesus will be confessing about you to the Father and angels. For this reason, we need not to be afraid of people, but to fear God and God alone. Because we want His applause, we want His protection, and we will have security in Him and no one else. That's why people got baptized. When they publicly confessed and went down to the water, they were saying, I believe in Jesus. Back then and today, there was a cost. Family rejection, friends thinking you are weird or something. Some would even die because of their conversion. But when they believed, they did not fear people, but God alone. Some of you are afraid of people. Some of you are afraid of people to openly confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, instead of fearing a holy God who can cast you into hell. If the foundation of your faith doesn't start with fearing God, then you have nothing to build it upon, and you can't get the rest. Until we fear God, you can't totally learn to love Him and understand why the holy God sacrificed His Son Jesus for you. It's an amazing thought when you get the whole picture.